This is code and system modularity. And per the request earlier today that you heard from Vivek, we want to orient you with the, uh, with the use case, the why, the so what, yada yada for the client. Well, our target clientele are platforms that have some kind of user-generated content on it that typically you would interact with. Think of a gaming studio that has a game chat or a dating app that works at all. You talk with people. So um, those platforms have a vested interest in having your experience on their platform be pleasant. So the more time you engage on their platform, the more profitable you are, or the more profitable their platform is. So they have a financial and reputation interest in making sure you have a good experience. To that, uh, to that point, they are keen to detect toxic behavior on their platforms, and the main reason for detecting it is to take action on it. They also want to do things like uh, detect positive behavior. And the reason that they would want to do this would be something like pairing a new user up with somebody that's going to have a high likelihood of a positive experience for this new user. So our platform detects toxic at first and now positive behaviors in conversational user-generated content and facilitates actioning on that content like recommendations or uh, content redaction mitigating, mitigating risks. So the way that we do this is we pull signal from multiple places. One is the history that we've seen so far in, for a conversation or a user. Metadata about the content that we're examining, like in what context was it in, how many users were, uh, were involved in a conversation, and what is the content of the message. We pull those signals together and come up with a determination. These determinations in our case are the presence of a given behavior, like hate speech, bullying, sexual content. As a concrete example, here if in the past we have seen a user submit a solicitation, some kind of I want you in a dating app, and we happen to know that this is a one-on-one -on -one chat between two users, and the response to that previous message, which is the current message we're examining, is a dismissal, like get lost, go away, then this is probably sexual harassment. If this pattern continues, then action's probably gonna need to be taken on the person submitting the solicitations. All right, so the, the main thing I want to focus on on this content is system and code modularity. And by system modularity, I mean, when do you break something into its own service? When do you uh, keep things together and why? So we'll examine some of our platform and why we made some of the decisions that we made and what the layout is. Now this isn't exactly, uh, we're not gonna examine exact parts of the system, I'm gonna kinda gloss over a lot of it. But let's start with some reasons that you might decide to take a service and make it its own thing or uh, break apart a service into two separate ones, separating some concerns. The first is the logical functional scope. This is basically the single responsibility principle. A good example of this is an authentication service. Something that determines whether or not a login was successful and whether or not someone is logged in. Gray areas get in when you ask things like, should permissions and uh, roles be included in there? They're very related, but anyway, that's one of the first components in the decision that we use when deciding whether or not a service should be a standalone thing. Another is resource consumption, and this is a little bit more interesting, and we'll go into a concrete case of how we broke a service apart because of resource consumption. This would be something like if a part of your code is very memory hoggy, and another part is very CPU intense, it makes financial sense to separate those. Another one would be workload. This is things like whether or not the uh, part of your code deals with direct responses, and uh, or asynchronous, you know, um, event-based processing. And the last one that I'll bring up is traffic throughput. So if there's a portion of your code that gets used for every single message that you deal with or every single request that comes into your system, that's getting a lot of uh, 
usage in your traffic. And then another component, if it's just uh, applied to 10% of those messages, you can probably carve off that 10% piece that's not used very often and uh, isolate its resources, uh, its resource consumption somewhere else. All right, so with that in mind, we have a layout. Um, this isn't exactly what it is and it's only a sliver of our system, but let's use this as an example. So we provide an HTTP JSON API that our clients send messages to us through. We do inferencing on those messages and return our determinations of what behaviors are present and maybe what actions should be taken. That API, whenever it needs to call one of our classifiers, calls an embedding service. This provides the, the vectors for the words that we're going to feed to the classifiers. Now, the API does two main, uh, communicates with two main systems. First, that embedding service, but the second is that it writes the content that we got in, the requests that we got in, and the determinations that we made and writes them to Kafka. Now, there are multiple systems that listen downstream to that Kafka feed. Two of them are uh, the ones we'll drill in a little bit more today. On the top is webhooks. In this context, a webhook is a mechanism through which our system makes an API call to some endpoint in a client system to notify them that certain conditions were met. These conditions are usually something like when we detect a sexual content in a message that's in a children's game submitted by an adult user, do something about it. So basically, tell us. So we, we trigger a webhook and call them. Another one is a moderation queue. So uh, although in an ideal world, we'd be able to automate everything and just say like, oh, we detected this, take it down. Oh, that was great. We should reward them, give them extra points or whatever. Uh, humans usually need to be in the loop for some of this stuff because not even humans agree on what is hate speech and what really is an insult. So we have a moderation queue that essentially indexes messages that we've received and the determinations or the behaviors that we've detected in them and weights them based off of severity. Something like child sexual abuse material would be ranked very, very high, whereas profanity, eh, maybe not so much. Okay, so <clears throat> on the far right of the diagram is a config service. This, uh, a few of these will peel back layers of the onion to examine. All right, so the first part is the API. Early on, when we started, we had a handful of nodes that were our API service, and our embeddings were pretty compressed. They were like two gig, it was okay. So uh, although the code that invokes uh, feeds data to and reads the output from a classifier is in a library that is just used by our API, another part of that library was the thing that goes and looks up, the, uh, that tokenizes the input and comes up with the vectors that you can actually feed to the classifier. Then we, you know, maybe double traffic and we, uh, if you're paying attention, we double our cost because we have to have, we're, we're pushing each of our machines as, to about the capacity that they can handle. We get more traffic, you need more machines. So there's the horizontal scaling that Vivek was talking about earlier. Then we cross a threshold. Oh yeah, uh, we wound up increasing the embeddings a little bit more. We train some of our own embeddings and we get new vocabulary, we add languages to, uh, that we support and so those embeddings grow. But we cross a threshold at one point where the memory pressure of the embeddings that we have on chip on our API nodes is conflicting with the memory that our API that feeds data to classifiers needs in order to do its work. So in this instance, we quadrupled the number of nodes that we have. In an ideal world, you only quadruple your cost. Well, in an ideal world, you, your cost stays simple, but in a real world, you quadruple your cost. Uh, but because of the memory pressure that we were having, we had to up our instance type which the, the target instance type that we would have landed on was three times more expensive than our first one. So if you're not even good at math, you can tell that that's 12 times the cost increase instead of four times the cost increase. Um, boards like don't like that. 
they, they like you to scale a little bit better than that. So at this point, we broke apart our embeddings into their own service. Of course, they speak gRPC, and so uh, we have rather low latency between our API that needs to feed data to classifiers when it goes to get embeddings. But it was still a reluctant thing. We're not a fan of breaking this apart because of what you heard earlier. We have about a 10 millisecond uh, latency that we want to hold on to. And that's very important for some of our clients. So we break this into a, a separate deployment. This embeddings deployment doesn't need very much CPU. On the very top right, you can see a graph of the CPU that is used by our embedding service. It's pretty simple. Embeddings are static. It's a hash lookup, essentially. But on the bottom is the CPU consumed by our code that invokes our classifiers. And uh, that uses a lot more CPU. So we can make it so that we have memory intense embedding instances uh, and lower memory, higher CPU instances for the code that's invoking our classifiers. And we can service about 200 API nodes with 15 embedding nodes. And that's uh, much better than 12x cost increase. So this was the, the first instance um, that I wanted to peel back the onion on a, a concrete example of why we separated these. Again, the reason was because of resource consumption, not because of speed or philosophical uh, alignment. OK. So over on the right, we have the config service. This config service, you might notice, is pointing to lots of things. Lots of things get their configuration from here. So let's dig into this one. This is a service that could arguably have started out as eight, I don't know, seven something services. Uh, there is configuration for webhooks. This is what stores the conditions under which we should fire a webhook, what URL we should hit, what client it belongs to, what API we should use to sign, uh, API key we should use to sign the request. Other things like, you know, what clients exist in the system, what behaviors that they've licensed. Okay, so although we could have a behavior service and a classifier service and a client service and a feature service and stuff like that, we decided not to. The reason we decided not to is uh, not very many of these are very interesting in and of themselves. Um, and we don't like making deployments just for the heck of it, although you could, and that's a totally different philosophy that we didn't embrace in this case. The main reason that we decided to keep these together is for simplicity of referential integrity. So what I mean by that is a webhook's uh, conditions under which it should fire generally involve the behaviors that a client has licensed. And so if we get a configuration for a webhook that says, hey, call us when you see hate speech and sexual in a child's game, and we look and, and say, well, you didn't license hate speech. You did license sexual, so this webhook will never, ever fire. We will never detect hate speech in your content because you didn't buy it from us. Uh, you can have referential integrity with separate systems, but generally that means they need to call each other or they need to share a data store. And there are all kinds of headaches with both of those. Sometimes it's worth the trade-off. In our case, we didn't feel it was. So we kept these as a single service. Uh, yes? I didn't, I missed the tie-in. I, I understand RI. Uh-huh. Oh, if they're separate services? Uh, well, it gets chatty. It, it can get chatty. For instance, if the webhooks don't have a list of behaviors licensed by a given client, and it gets a request to say, hey, add a new webhook to notify us when hate speech and sexual were detected together in a child's game, the webhook config service, since it doesn't know what behaviors are licensed, it's not the system of record for what is licensed by the client. It has to either make a call to another service or it needs to query a data store that has that data in it. So uh, it, it can. Both of those are valid solutions. We just decided not to go with them. And in our case, it didn't make very much sense. So yeah, that's, thanks for clarifying. Any, any other points that I, I glossed over maybe too much? OK, cool. Thanks. All right. Back to the uh, systems that listen downstream. This is. Um, yeah, okay, I think we're, we're good on time for this one. So 
There are two systems that look very, very similar, and they could have been one service, but we started them out as separate services. And uh, let's dig into why. The first is the webhook service. We've gone over what essentially that is, but um, the moderation queue, we've also touched on what that is. But a nuance here that I want to point out is they listen to the exact same data. Although I have Kafka here, we have tons of Kafka topics. These two happen to listen to the primary data feed that we have, which is the request we got from a client and the determinations that we uh, reached based off of that content and our inferencing and business logic. So as a reminder, the moderation queue shows messages that maybe a human wants to review and the webhooks automate actions on them. Okay, so there is a relationship between these two systems that can get interesting. For instance, one of the conditions that a webhook can define to uh, can be defined to fire upon is if a moderator confirms child sexual abuse material happened, then call NICMIC, uh, the national, national child, it's call the authorities. So uh, that means that in order to fire a webhook, you need to know whether or not a moderator clicked, yeah, I agree, and we should take action. Okay, so that's argument number one for them maybe being the same system, but they're not. I'll get into how we, uh, how we get them to agree. Um, another one is that if a message comes through that has, let's say, just profanity in a child's game, uh, we are pretty high precision in profanity. We're pretty damn good at finding F-bombs. Uh, so, so some of our clients want to automate that without making a human bother looking at it. One of the things that that means is that uh, if we detect profanity in a child's game, it could be in the moderation queue. You want a human to at least know something happened, but that moderation queue should probably be updated with information about what's going on with a webhook. Has a webhook already been fired? Did it fail? Do we need to take action again? Uh, does a human really need to inter uh, intervene on this message? So there needs to be a feed if they're separate. What we did is have a feed from the webhook system that is read by the moderation queue. When an action happens for a webhook, whether we make a call, it's successful or isn't successful, we write some kind of log about that, the moderation queue listens to that and updates its internal record for that Kafka message. Remember, they're listening to the same, they're focusing on the same primary Kafka messages, so they have the same key. So it's pretty easy to sync up records. This is record one, two, three, four. I did something with record one, two, three, four. Okay, the moderation queue similarly writes a log of what happens in the system, what's been confirmed, what's been cleared, what uh, behaviors have been added. Sometimes a moderator might say, yeah, all right, this was an insult, but it was also a racial slur. And that has a different penalty than just an insult. So, uh, there's a feed going from our moderation queue into our, uh, our webhooks. And I don't mean to say that philosophically the absolute right decision was separating them uh, because the, the next example about the interaction between these two systems really feels like it would be easier if they were related to each other. But it will be a gateway into our next discussion, which is code modularity. In our moderation queue, it might be nice for a moderator to look at a message that has some content that needs to be actioned and know what action will be taken. So that means the moderation queue needs to know, all right, if the moderator confirms this case, what webhooks are going to fire and what actions do those webhooks imply? So the moderation queue could make a call to the webhook service and say, hey, for this message, if we take this action, what are you gonna do? Could do that, we didn't. Uh, and uh, the, the other approach is they could be the same damn system and it could just ask itself what it's going to do. The mechanism that we landed on is a library that lives in both of these systems that is able to uh, not give a shit about what context it's running in. It doesn't need to know that it's running in the moderation queue to ask what's going to happen in the webhook system. The webhook, is the system is using the exact same code and is asking that exact same thing, hey, what should I do now that I've gotten this message? And so they, they wind up agreeing in that case. All right, so that leads us to our code modularity. So before I move on from that, 
Uh, there are all kinds of theories about when you should break up a system and, and things like that. I want to ask you, is there any mechanism that you use as a decision or deciding point for creating a system, a standalone system, or breaking a system up into multiple microservices? Yeah. And by changes apart, or changes together, what do you mean? I mean that if, if to implement some new feature or whatever, you have to uh, make changes in all these different places throughout the code, mm -hmm. those different places should actually be the same place. Gotcha. That, that the mm -hmm. ideal is that to implement anything, you're modifying like one function in one pocket. Yeah, that's an impossible ideal. That's how I think of it. So, uh, I remember a project. Um, in, in school, there was a team that was writing a kernel, and they had like kernel.h. And kernel, <laughs> like it was one file. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty awesome. Uh, it, it, did, it did not work well. Uh, so it was not my team. Um, that, that point, thank you for bringing that up, because one thing I meant to mention about the embedding service versus our API service is that our embeddings, although they do change, they don't change very much. And our embedding service winds up taking a decent amount of time to start because it's loading like 30 gig of uh, embeddings into its space. But we add features to our API service all the freaking time. And so uh, this slow moving, slow starting service is great. We just leave it there. I think the instances we have have been running for months at this point. Uh, but our API services restarted today. So, all right. Uh, code modularity. Um, this one's a little bit closer to my heart. I care an awful lot about code layout and uh, um, design patterns that you follow that make code easy to maintain. And so uh, in order to paint a, a use case for um, the principles I'm going to cover, let's go over the first thing I did as a full-time employee at Spectrum. The first thing I did was build a Spark job that took data that we either scraped or got from a client ran it through our classifiers. We didn't even have behavior detection at that point. We just had classifiers that made a prediction. Uh, and then write the data back to some mechanism that can be used for analytics, uh, like a health assessment for a client. This is the prevalence of hate speech on your platform, and this is the demographic that uh, is contributing that, um, that content to your platform. Um, if this is the only context that you're given, it's very, very tempting. Uh, well, I should, I should state that uh, at, at this point, there was no code that I could use for the Spark job that invoked our classifiers. Although we had classifiers, uh, none of them were going to be invocable in Spark. So I had to write all that from scratch. It would be very tempting to say, all right, well, I'm going to start making a, uh, a classifier um, invoker that takes a row. A row is a data structure inside Spark. Uh, that makes an awful lot of sense. Or I could make an API that's like, hey, for this data frame, transform it by applying these classifiers to all the records. In doing that, the code that has the logic to uh, extract data, feed it to a classifier, invoke that classifier, and get the results back would be glued to Spark. And we'll, we'll see an example of how that sucks. Uh, I happen to know that we were going to make an API. Now, in this instance, we're going to get individual messages formatted in JSON going through an HTTP web server that is going to feed that exact same data to our classifiers, the exact same classifiers, and is going to spit out a JSON response. What is the consistent thing uh, that is present on each sides of the screen here? There's only one thing that's consistent besides arrows. Yeah, the logic that invokes the classifiers. So the idea is that, uh, that I want to focus on is that you want to create code that doesn't care what the input looked like when it got to you or what the context is that it's running in. So <clears throat> uh, back to our Spark example of if I had written code that consumed a, a, a data frame, it's not a data frame. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, it, yeah, it is a data frame, a, a row, whatever, in Spark. That means when I put the classifier invoking code in my web app, I would have had the entire class path. We happen to work in JVM land. 
uh, but this, this idea works for uh, anything. The dependencies that are in that system would be present and pulled over into the system that you plug it into. Now, I don't know in the last 48 hours if you've done a dependency graph for Spark, but if you did, it would look exactly like the right side of the screen because that's what I did. Uh, if you did a SBT dependency tree, you'd get over 26,000 lines. In fact, it's so messed up that I zoomed in on less than 10% of it, and that's what's on the left side of the screen, and even that is a clusterfuck. So I don't want any of that stuff, which has nothing to do with our classifiers and has nothing to do with ML in the first place, as part of our library that invokes our classifiers and executes our business logic to make the determinations that our clients rely on. So uh, I often reference three insanely coarse um, layers of an application. There's so many nuances between these, but let, let's just go with these three. First is the protocol. And by protocol, I don't mean like the P in HTTP, although the, the, there's overlap. Uh, it, it is the context and the input format that you get your raw data in. And then there's a storage layer. Uh, pretty obvious, we're all pretty familiar with, with this. Some kind of persistent state that you wanna remember uh, and is also important for horizontal scalability. And then right in the middle is your logic. Okay, so notice there's a gap between these. Usually, we have something like a DAO. A lot of people follow the pattern where your business logic consumes a DAO. If you're not familiar, a DAO is a data access object. It's a lightweight API, well, ideally lightweight API, that takes domain models like a customer order or a user something like that that is specific to your domain and translates it into a persistent format like Postgres or Dynamo or S3 or something. So that's a pretty uh, familiar concept, but what I see a lot of times, I, I know a lot of this is like, yeah, we learned this in like CS 2000. A lot of people don't follow these though, especially in startups. People are like fast and loose and they're like, okay, I'm, I have this you know, behavior uh, detection service and I, I need an Amazon S3 in there and then blah, 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 I'm gonna do this with, S, with S3. And then all of a sudden, your business logic that determines behaviors is tied to Amazon and can't go to GCP without major refactor. Okay, so the reason I'm highlighting this is even senior engineers I see do this. So this middleware stuff like a storage service um, helps make your code not care where it runs or what's beneath it. There's not really a great name that I'm aware of for that top uh, fill gap. I'm gonna call it a bridge. Um, I'm, I'll go ahead and solicit better names for that. But this would be code that is specific to the context in which you're running. In a web app, this might be a, a play app, it might be a controller, or if you're old school, a servlet, right? it knows specifically about requests and protocol and sessions and shit like that. And what its job is, is to translate the input <clears throat> that you, uh, the input format that you get uh, on the edge of your application and turn it into the domain model that your business logic can use. Uh, typically, this, um, this is specific to the context and uh, yeah, it's, its main job is translating to your, your business logic and it is a consumer of your business logic. Okay, so ideally these middleware things are lightweight uh, um, APIs, a trait, an interface that has no implementation. And the reason for that is so that you can have separate implementations of them. Um, I don't know why this, this concept sometimes at Salesforce in particular really through junior engineers. The idea that you can say, give me a storage service instead of give me the S3 storage service or give me a DAO instead of give me the Postgres DAO. It just threw them for a loop. Uh, I, I don't know why. A concrete example that we had come up was the uh, frequency tracker. So we keep track of how many times we've seen a given user display a, uh, a given behavior or a conversation, um, something like that. And when we had originally written it, you remember to my slide that had 24 nodes, uh, it was backed by Dynamo. Um, then we had a client that wanted to do a load test for us and they threw 50,000 QPS at us. 
Uh, and although Dynamo can handle all kinds of stuff, you have to pay out the nose for it. So because none of our code knew that we were using Dynamo behind this API, in a day, we were able to create a Redis instance of that, deploy it, and uh, then the client was blown away. That like the first day, if our stuff fell over, the second day, they, they couldn't throw enough traffic at us. And they they were pretty floored by that. That was cool. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I'm going to gloss over here in the interest of time. Uh, and because we're behind a little bit, I'll go over uh, just the, the very last part. But what I want to highlight here is just the, the concrete code looking. This happens to be Scala, and we're using dependency injection. The consuming of a storage service here doesn't know about the S3 storage service. It just knows that there's a storage service. The thing I want to highlight about this design pattern in uh, API-driven design is that this makes unit testing really easy. If you find yourself bending over backwards to test code that you're writing, it's maybe not that portable. If you have to do things like power mocks and things like that, you might have some tight coupling with systems that you maybe want to avoid. OK, so uh, the, the thing that is probably the most important for me in code layout for uh, portability and maintainability is the modularity in uh, artifacts. So sometimes this might look like there's a GitHub repo for the Postgres DAO. And there's a separate GitHub repo for the local services and another one for AWS services. And this does not need to be the case. You can have a single repo with um, modular deployable artifacts that only uh, pull in the dependencies that they need. So ideally, the API.jar has zero dependencies besides like maybe, maybe logging, you know, something like that. But it shouldn't reference S3 at all. It shouldn't reference the AWS SDK. It shouldn't reference GFS. It's just the thing that defines what the APIs look like and what you need to give them and what you get back. Then there's an implementation of that jar, and it's going to depend on the API jar. This is the resource that is kind of the, the central piece for um, all, all implementations. And then there are multiple implementations of the supporting services. Now, the idea is that when you deploy these to something like a web app or a Spark app, you can have different, uh, it is the job of the context to determine which supporting libraries, it will pull in to power your business logic. And your business logic shouldn't give a shit if it's using a static config service, something that's passed to a Spark jar, or if it's using a gRPC config service that calls our config service that I showed in the diagram. It also shouldn't care whether or not you're talking to Redis or if you're talking to Postgres. So uh, the layout, um, I, I could probably make a presentation just on this, on how you lay out the code in the class path dependencies or in Python, your, your library uh, inclusions, things like that, um, because it's, it's, I think, not enough people that I've seen care to think about what dependencies they're pulling in. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is pretty close to my heart. So um, yeah, any questions, feedback, hate mail, whatever? Yeah, thanks. The, uh, I also care about how the ages, right? Because ages, yeah. Mm -hmm. You care about how it ages, yeah. Well, right, because those versions will change. Mm -hmm. Those dependencies will surface. Yep. Your day will be wrong. Yeah, if you don't separate them. And yeah, if you have tight coupling, the, uh, the impact of change is a lot more uh, expensive with tighter coupling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who are hacker startup types to actually care about the code architecture. Like they, they just, you know, they have an idea and they're just like, uh, you know, the easiest places, I'll put the code there. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it accumulates dirt and entropy and you know, <laughs> sooner or later every change we make breaks the whole system, you know. And, um, how do you do that persuasion? 
Yeah, uh, I don't think anybody's really solved that, but I've got a couple tricks or uh, a couple things that, I don't know, seem to kind of be working. The first is leading by example. Uh, my, my codes, because um, I have OCD about it, it's pretty damn clean. And so uh, it's also pretty modular. And so um, I'm, I'm, it's, our scenario is kind of fortunate in that the code that I primarily own is the thing that powers lots of other places. And so people have to bump into it a lot. So they're seeing my code and they're like, oh, okay, I have to pull in this other library because I'm in a Spark job, got it, okay. I need to override the implementation of that interface in order to make it so that this runs well in the Spark job, something like that. Uh, so lead by example, and the second one is code reviews. Um, there are only so many hours in a day, so I can't do a lot of them, but uh, we have a pretty top-notch team, and so um, the uh, kind of hand-in-hand -hand with the code reviews is your hiring process. So um, one of the things that we do is make people code live, and uh, I, I give much more um, attention to how they're coding and what decisions they're making on their code layout than about the efficiency of the implementation that they're, they're doing. I can mentor, you know, well, Josh can probably mentor anybody. I can mentor a decent number of people on how to make something faster. But making it well-written, that's a lot harder to do. So we're really picky about who we are. It, that's a really big challenge. I mean, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why would you, and the one that I get a lot when I talk to, like, experienced engineering managers, which is not on this list, okay. is scaling the team horizontally. Mm. Okay. It's like, it, these are very technical reasons, but one of the reasons I, I get a lot is, like, we have to break this service up because, like, we're, we're already at 20 engineers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good call out. I didn't mean for this to be definitive. Uh, these are just ones that come to our mind. Uh, we have like, you know, 30, 30 plus people in the entire company, so we don't, we don't quite have the too many people are working on it problem. But excellent call out. Yeah, if you have too much um, contention on updates to a system, I think of, again, Salesforce, the entire thing's like a monolith, it was horrible. Uh, it really should be broken up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, good call. All right, well, thank you. Uh, i give you six minutes back in your day, and hopefully we'll catch up on the schedule today. But uh, six whole minutes. I mean, well, 5.58, six, it's counting down. We're losing time. <laughs> you, oh, yeah, sure. So you all right? I have water. All right. Uh, okay, uh, what do you mean by the um, Kafka latency, like the... Um, Oh. No, it's it's all good. I mean, people, you're you're welcome to hang out and listen to Kafka or or go do something maybe more fun. Uh, so we have something like twenty topics. Yeah, what's more fun than Kafka? Come on. Uh, okay, so something like twenty topics. Uh, our our main topic gets about twelve thousand um, messages per second that we feed into it. Uh, we're using MSK. And we actually have Kafka deployed in four regions, but we do our central processing in one region. Uh, that happens to be configurable. We could move where we're centrally processing this stuff, but for a couple of reasons, we do most of the analysis of the data that we get in in US West. And you're doing 10 mil terms, is that right? Or is that different? Uh, 10, 10 milliseconds. Oh, yeah. 10, 10 milliseconds is uh, the time on our CPU. Network is a variable depending on where people are. But yeah, we, once a request hits our API CPU, in about 10 to 15 milliseconds, we have the response sent out on the wire. And so you bought the MSK stuff, you the side? That would be a platform team question. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But the, the nuance that I want to highlight for you is the fact that um, so we're writing to Kafka, obviously, asynchronously. And uh, so it's not blocking or adding to any of our latency. But um, in our satellite regions, uh, you know, Frankfurt, Seoul, and US East, we are writing to a smaller Kafka cluster, and we have Mirror Maker on it. And then that Mirror Maker sends it to our larger cluster in US West. 
and then all of our consuming services read from that. Uh, nobody's reading from the satellite regions. We're only writing to them. So, uh, mainly, most of our distribution of um, availability zones and regions is latency based, where our clients are, yeah, where their data centers are. But uh, it helps. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, now, we, we typically see, I don't know, in single digit seconds latency for our reading. We use Kafka streams. And um, one of the benefits of, that I forgot to highlight about the, the webhooks and the um, moderation queue, uh, this is kind of nice from a platform perspective, is that because those two systems uh, do a decent amount of work and they listen to the same topic, it's kind of a, a decent bellwether for whether Kafka is having an issue or our app is having an issue. If they were the same app and it stopped processing messages, you're not really sure, did Kafka die? Is, I mean, we have dashboards on that too, but you don't know if something's going on with Kafka or something's going on with your app. But if you've got these two apps that listen to the exact same thing, processing at about the same rate, and one of them starts lagging behind, but the other one isn't, Kafka's probably fine, your other service is probably fine, you maybe need to look into the slower service. It's just really easy to be like, oh, well, what's going on over there? Okay, well, the problem's here. And yeah, it is. It's nice to have, but sh it's shit to maintain. Yeah, absolutely agree. Well, that's cool. Good for you guys. All right. Thanks.